security measure gives at least some protection to 30 millions of our citizens. Year by year, your wage credits build up. Credits that mean earned security for you and your family. With a guest list that read like the who's who of Social Security, the Silver Anniversary Celebration of the Signing of the Social Security Act was launched in Washington. The Social Security Administration played host to dignitaries past and present. The Department of Health, Education, and Welfare Auditorium was filled to capacity at 2 p.m. on Monday, August 15th. Social Security Commissioner William Mitchell, presiding at the rostrum, began the milestone event. Secretary Arthur Fleming made opening remarks and introduced Madam Frances Perkins, who was Secretary of Labor during the Roosevelt administration when the legislation was put into effect. Madam Perkins, a vivacious woman who had retired to lecturing on industrial and labor relations at Cornell University, spoke extemporaneously about the early days of the program, adapted from the 25th anniversary article from Oasis. Now, as uh, uh, Secretary Fleming has already pointed out, uh, we are just tremendously honored here today by having Ms. Perkins with us. Uh, your presence here today, Ms. Perkins, really makes our day complete. And uh, uh, we hope while I realize that it's something of an imposition uh, upon you, without more warning, uh, we, we would hope that you would find it possible to say a few words of greeting. Anna Perkins. here today, I cannot tell you what it means to me to meet you all on an occasion like this and to realize suddenly that I must have grown very old in these 25 years because I see on some of you whom I thought of as the working boys of the first staff of the uh, that enterprise that was attempting to bring forth the Social Security Act, I see some of you touched with the gray. And I even see uh, 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 Senator Carlson, now a senator, but in, in 1935, only a member of Congress, I see that he too has been touched with that terrible uh, mark of the passage of time. And so I know uh, that there is something very real and important to the human race, something that is good for us, to look back every now and then at the roots of our beginnings, to see what they were, why they were, who and who took the trouble and the enterprise uh, to build up an institution, which like this institution of Social Security in the United States of America, has become, as Franklin Roosevelt said, the cornerstone of his administration. For I think that nothing that was done during his day has brought so much uh, credit to his name and to his wisdom as has this one thing. And this, of course, is due to the activity and the effort and the understanding and the planning of thousands of people, not only those who took part in the original uh, investigation and in the original uh, survey of the possibilities, but to those who have administered uh, this program down through the years and are still administering it. And I think, too, that as we stand here and as we sit here and think about this precious child, we want to see it grow. It has grown enormously in these years. It has improved, its administration has grown bigger and bigger as imagination of those in charge have pointed out what could be done. But there is yet much that needs to be done and that I hope in God's good time will be done by bipartisan action as were the last amendments. This I think is one of the things we need to remind ourselves of. And I think, too, that we must remind ourselves of a few of the people who are not here today and who have gone to their last reward. And in particular, I think of Ed Whitty of Wisconsin, who did heroic major work of writing with his own hand, 
the, the, deliver, the, the results of the deliberations of committees and subcommittees and student researchers and who drove a high-powered team of volunteer workers uh, who came to do the research work uh, for those of us who had the responsibility of developing uh, and proposing to the president and by the president to the Congress uh, the Social Security Act. For this was a thrown together team, as many of you remember. We had no money. It was a great misfortune. Uh, the, the Committee on Economic Security had been appointed, but nobody remembered to have the Congress pass an appropriation for us to work on. It was a little embarrassing, and it seemed as though it couldn't be done. Uh, but uh, by one device and another, it was all honest. Everything we did was honest. <laughs> Uh, but we borrowed the money uh, from, uh, from Harry Hopkins, as a matter of fact. $125,000, an enormous sum, but that was what it needed. It was all that it took uh, to get the Social Security work, get the Social Security investigations and research and proposals and planning and law writing underway. Uh, and, uh, well, we borrowed it, and that was all there was to it. We never paid any interest, and I've never yet known whether we... Uh, but we employed unemployed, uh, uh, unemployed uh, uh, stenographers and typewriters and college professors and people like that. Uh, to somebody else, you know how easy that sort of thing is. The Labor Department, of course, uh, we gave over almost bodily. I said to this morning to someone, I think that 80% of the people who work for the Labor Department were all working for the Social Security program <laughs> and because they, they were available. And agriculture was nice and generous, and they gave us a good many. I may say that Treasury, which was also on the Economic uh, uh, Security Committee, which the President appointed, gave us just two very measly little things. <laughs> office gave us nobody except uh, Mr. Holsoff, who was a who was a thousand man in himself. He was so good. He's now a judge, I believe, and I, I hope he's happy because he did a, he did an amazing amount of legal work for nothing for us. But this was all that we had to work with. Uh, and then we got in this group of we had, of course, the great help of the advisory council, uh, who were really remarkable in what they were able to do and in the support they were able to muster for the ideas and in their, in their support behind the working staff. And then we borrowed the working staff from all over the country. I remember it was just a telegram saying, we have no money, we can pay your railroad fare and your expenses if you really need expenses while you are in Washington, but there is no salary, will you come? And we only had one refusal. And the people who knew the most about these ex existing security systems in other countries uh, came and worked willingly and worked at high pressure all through a summer so different from this one that you can hardly believe it possible. And this was the team of high-powered people, uh, professors from all over the country who made witty, had to drive and from whom he had to extract a program and to whom he had to break the news. Uh, that this particular idealistic uh, pattern, which some professor had thought out, wouldn't do because, you know, the Senate, the Congress, the Supreme Court, politics, and <laughs> it was not an easy thing to drive. Uh, but this was a very different summer, and I shouldn't talk more uh, about the past because no one likes to hear the reminiscences of those who uh, may be incorrect in a part of their reminiscence. Uh, but this, this summer was so different. I wish I could make it clear to you. It was, in the first place, it was hot, really hot. If any of you have looked at the newspaper pictures of the Congress assembled in that long, hot period, because they didn't adjourn and didn't adjourn, we're still in session in August, uh, have looked at the pictures of the, uh, of the ceremony of signing the bill in President Roosevelt's office, have looked at the bedraggled state of the hair and the clothes of the member of the people who were there present, we realized it was a terrifically hot Washington summer. And we worked all through that terrifically hot summer. And then again, there was another difference. We were not yet out of the woods of the Great Depression. And of course, it was the Great Depression, which we must never forget in this country, which was the proximate cause 
of this movement, which was launched at that time, this movement to write under the, under the lives of the American people a basis of security which came to them out of the orderly and, and substantial and regular co contributions to their future and to the future hazards. It would not have been done in that year, I am sure, except for the fact that the Great Depression was still faring us in the face, and we were conscious of it whenever we walked on the streets of Washington. These were the different days. Today, this is a very different world. You even have air conditioning, which we never heard of, you know. There wasn't an air conditioning spot in Washington in 34 and 35. And as for how we were going to keep the records, you know, of the Social Security uh, program once it was launched was one of the great problems. Uh, the IBM uh, hadn't yet invented uh, the machines which you all operate so easily. And I want you to realize that it took some uh, uh, courage, uh, uh, Mr. Secretary, to launch the program without the IBM machines. And I never thought. <laughs> I did not add, uh, under any circumstances, it was very, I was always a little bit nervous about it. And I remember the day that Arthur Rothmeyer, who was then uh, uh, First Assistant Secretary of Labor, walked into my office and said, you know, I think we found it. I think we have found it because we've been talking about, you know, handwritten pieces of records and uh, how they were to be organized and stacked up. I think we've found it. These new IBM machines, I believe they can do it. And so out of that, uh, that really, uh, that inventive group uh, that worked in the IBM research uh, group, uh, we found the way by which this could be done. And so I think at every step, uh, as the Social Security program has progressed from year to year and year to year, and in the attitude of the people themselves toward the payment of the tax, there has come the answers to many of the questions that we knew not how to solve when we began, but which we were determined we had to solve. And I am thankful to say uh, that I believe we did solve them, and I learned from your own speech uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, that you too believe that problem has been solved and that we will go forward into the future a stronger nation because of the fact that we have this basic rock of security under all of our people.